Mark chapter 1 and verse 18. Mark chapter 1 and verse 18. Just one verse of scripture and then we're going to pray. And straightway they forsook their nets. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Reverend Walker, would you please pray? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Father God, tonight for the reading of your word. I ask now that you would function the man of God afresh, that you would lead God, direct him, that you would make preaching easy, that you would soften each and every one of our hearts, that you give us receptive ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say unto the church tonight. We thank you, we honor you, we praise you for it. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray these things. Amen. 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 God's good. Mark chapter 1, and this is a very familiar passage of scripture, and probably one of, uh, preached from this place several times, and so throughout the years, but I want to look at, dig in this for just a little while and preach to you on the title of the message, Nets. Why don't you say that with me, Nets. 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 We had a good day today, out soul winning, visiting, um, just being about the Father's business, and so I'm thankful to have the privilege to be with you today. You know, we don't know how much longer that we have. Uh, Jeremy and, and Logan couldn't make it this evening because they're at a memorial for a friend of theirs or a fellow in their unit that got out of the military, was on his way home, and on his way home, he ran to the back of a semi and died. And so it's pretty, we don't know how much time we have, we need to take advantage of the time that we have. Amen? Amen. And, and be ready to meet the Lord, be ready to go home and see Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to going to heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. Looking forward to it. Mark chapter 1. And so we have an, a special opportunity in God's house this evening to look, to look into God's word. I hope the ladies had a good time today. You guys had a little, uh, little time to themselves also and just being about the Father's business. You know, what's that? Be a blessing to each other. So, Mark chapter 1. And I'm going to read just a couple verses of scripture, verses 14 through 20. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, verse 15, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets, and straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the higher servants and went after him. We're using for our text verse 18, and straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. As we're going to look at this and as we're going to introduce this gospel of Mark, this is the first chapter in the gospel of Mark. Many believe that it's the history of the apostle Peter dictated by, by Mark, this, by this, this uh, faithful servant of, of Christ, Mark. It's believed it's Peter's history, Mark giving the account of his life in Christ. However, it's interesting that this story, if it is Peter's history, which many scholars believe that it is, does not begin with the day that Peter first met the Lord. It doesn't start with the day that Peter first met Jesus, but rather it starts with when Peter started to follow him. And really, the day that our story with Christ begins is the day that we begin to follow him. Amen? We could look a little bit further, uh, look into the Gospel of John, and we would see the, the account of when Christ first, or excuse me, when Christ was first introduced to the, to the Apostle Peter at this time. His name was Simon. The Word of God says this in chapter 1 of John, verse 40, And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which means Peter, which is interpretation a stone. And so we see here the first account of Peter meeting Jesus was there, which is, as we just read to you, the Lord was into, he was introduced to the Lord by his brother Andrew. Thank God for brothers. Amen? Amen? Thank God for somebody that has an outward vision. Andrew went and got his brother, introduced him to the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that the answer for his life his answer for his brother's lives and all the things that were going on in his life was Christ. He had met the Messiah and he wanted his family to meet him as well. And every one of us, we want our families to meet Jesus. Amen? We want our families to meet Jesus. We want our friends to meet Jesus. 
We want everybody to meet Jesus because if we've met Christ and we've tasted the Lord and we know that he's good and we want everybody else to have that same experience. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the Holy Ghost baptism. Amen. I'm thankful for a power of God and a salvation. I'm thankful for a reality in God, not just a religion, not just a head knowledge of who Jesus is, but a heart knowledge. Why is this a respectable answer as we begin to dig into this? Uh, uh, what was going on here in this situation, this first encounter? Notice as we made the reference, this was not the day that, G that Peter would first follow Jesus. Let me just read a little bit more into this. Peter had his companion, Mark, record the day, the moment, the very minute that he started to let the great fisher of men, Jesus, direct his steps. A man or a woman is not a child of God the minute they meet the Lord, but the minute they begin to follow him. We may meet him, but that doesn't mean we're following him. We might know who he is, but it doesn't mean he's our Lord. And he can't be just our Savior. He has to be also our Lord. He has to be our king, our guide, our closest friend. He must be the one that we wake up and think about, that we go to bed with on our mind. He's the one that causes us to love everybody else better. If, if we don't, without Christ, we don't really know how to love each other. Amen? Because Jesus never gave up on us. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. The steps of a good man or woman. How many good women do we have around here? Amen. I see a couple right now. Some good men too. They're the type that let Jesus lead them. They say, God, what do you want for my life? What's your goal? What's your hopes? What's your dreams? What do you want me to do? Somebody that knows the Lord lets Jesus lead them. Well, how do I know? You pray. You talk to God. God will direct your steps. He'll use the pastor to help you along the way. He'll, he'll direct you. But one thing that's true is God, the Bible says, by this, all men and all you my disciples, that you have loved one toward another. It was God that sealed me in our church. I got, I got saved in a barracks room, walked out of that barracks room, got invited to one of our churches. When I got filled with the Holy Ghost, it was like as if God said, this is the place that I want you to go to church. These are your brethren. Pray for them. Pray for them. And I knew exactly what he meant because I'm a brother. I got three brothers. I love them very much. And I learned how to be a brother by being around other brothers as a kid. You know, I, was, I forget who it was that was saying it. I was, it, was, uh, it was Logan the other day. You know, it's, it's something about brothers and sisters. Brothers can beat up each other, but nobody else can beat, each other, beat them up. Like, when I, like I, can, I can beat up my brother. I can try anyway. But don't let anybody else lay hands on them. You know, sometimes we can, we can uh, sometimes correct each other, but don't let anybody else correct us, right? It's like, thank God for family, amen? amen. And there's something about brothers that, and sisters, they stick together. They're out, they look out for one another, but they, they, you know, we have to make the right decisions. We've got to follow Jesus. We've got to look to the Lord and be there for one another. And so the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord. Peter would learn this very well. He would fall while walking with Jesus on water, but Jesus would uphold him. As we know the account where he had this situation where he began to walk on water. And I would just want to share this, that you will stumble along your walk with Jesus. There will be times in your life you'll stumble. Now, this isn't a defeated gospel. I'm just trying to be real here. You're going to go places you haven't been before. You're going to experience things you haven't experienced before. You're going to be in situations that you, have, you, you don't even know how to respond because you've never experienced before. But you're going to learn in those situations to, look at, to listen to that still small voice, to look to the Lord, to not take matters into your own hands, but to trust God. You're going to learn to trust God. And then when in those places, real faith kicks in. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We don't know if we have faith until we're tried. We don't know what we really believe until we put to the test. We, it's easy to give until you have very little money. Can I get an amen? amen. It's easy to, to trust God when you've got all the resources, but when you don't, it's a different story. It's easy to say amen when the pastor doesn't talk about your sin, but it's a little more difficult when he does. I mean, I'm talking about. You know, people get up and they would say and they would share certain things. You're like, amen, get him, pastor. Immediately, minute, he start, minute the Holy Spirit starts to touch our little pet area. Oh, you can't expect me to be that holy now, can you? <laughs> yes, Jesus is calling us. Amen? He's calling us to not be the same people we used to be, but to be like him. So we'll stumble along our walk. But if you walk with, but if you walk with Jesus, you'll walk on water. You'll become more than you ever were before. You'll experience things you never thought possible. 
You'll step out of your comfort zone and you'll experience a great story. We're getting ready. We're talking about the day that, Mar that Peter rather met Jesus. We're talking about nets. We're talking about nets. Let's dig into this now as we begin to look at our text and as our, at our Bible reading. In verse 14, this was the right time in Peter's life. Thank God for the gospel. Amen? Amen. Thank God for the word of God. Sometimes we have the gospel introduced to us, but we're not yet ready for it. How many know I'm talking about? When you were raised in church or you were raised around it, you heard the word of God, but it hadn't taken root in the heart just yet. You can always tell when the, when the gospel takes root in somebody's heart because you don't have to talk them into coming to church. They want to be in church. Can I get an amen? amen? You can tell when somebody has Jesus in their heart because you don't have to talk them into reading their Bible. They want to read their Bible. As one man said, this is a 66-book love letter from God to you. And I like reading it and hearing everything God has to say about me. He helps me along the way. You don't have to talk. You have to, don't have to talk somebody who knows Jesus into talking to Jesus and praying because it's just part of who they are. It's something they want to do. They're, uh, they've been captivated. Their mind has been touched by God. They've been divinely uh, inspired. It's, thing, it's a thing called grace. They've been divinely influenced, and it's reflected in their lives. Their heart's been touched. They're no longer the same. And so in verse 14, he says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. What was the gospel of the kingdom of God? It was when the gospel of the kingdom of God comes into play, the limitations of our lives are removed. We might have been an alcoholic, but now when Jesus steps on the scene, he can, he can break us free from being an alcoholic. We might have been a, a liar, but when Jesus touches our heart, we can lose that moniker or that identifier on our lives. We can start being truthful. Amen? We might have uh, been an adulterer, but Jesus gets a hold of our lives, and all of a sudden, that leaves our lives. Now we're always faithful, just like he is. Amen? We, things may come our way. We might have been on drugs, and we might have looked, we were looking for a high, but once we got filled with the Holy Ghost, we found out that there's nothing higher than God. Amen? You can have the garbage that the world has. I found something that really satisfies. We might have found ourselves in any manner of situations, running up and down the beach, chasing after people in their colored underwear. Maybe we were wearing ours. But then we meet Jesus, and we realize, let's put our clothes back on and wear some modest apparel. That's the Word of God. Well, Brother Ross, you know you're meddling. No, I'm just sharing God's word with you. It's in 1 Peter. It's in 2 Timothy. It's all over the word of God. What are you talking about? The Bible tells us that we're not to draw attention to the flesh, but draw attention to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, if you're being critical. So we, well, I, you should, well, what, you're being so narrow-minded. Okay, so next week we'll have a baptism, and I'll be out there in my Speedo. Sounds like a good idea? Pastor Ross, you doing baptism in the Speedo? Yes, sir. No, not a good idea. It won't be, that'll be dangerous. I don't even want to see that video. All right, thank you, Jesus. We are not live streaming, right? So, all right. What's your, well, it's different. You're a preacher. I'm just as much a child of God as you are. Amen? Well, I'm a Christian. I wear a Christian bathing suit. I got a cross on the back of my thong. I'm fine. All right. We are crazy, Brother Rossi. Well, the world's crazy. Might as well just call it out like it is. Amen? God's good. I mean, God loves you today. Amen. I wasn't planning on sharing that. God knows. It's hot. It's summertime. Maybe that's, who knows. How many of God loves you today? Amen. Amen. All right. God's good. Appreciate the Lord. Now we're all having church. Let's get into this. All right. So Jesus came in, preached about the kingdom of God. What is it? You know, if we really had a godly society, you'd be able to walk down the street and you'd be able to tell from 100 yards away that that's a woman and that's a guy and you wouldn't be confused. Amen? Amen. But you'd, you'd be able to tell it, and they would all, but you also would never have, have a problem lusting because people would be dressed appropriately. You wouldn't be able to read the hand. I'm just, what, Ross, why are you on? Okay. How many of God loves you today? Amen. God wants us to accentuate the sexes. In other words, if you're a guy, dress like a guy. If you're a woman, dress like a woman. But at the same time, you do it in a modest way, in a, in a classy way, in an honorable way, in a way that brings honor to God. We're not trying to draw attention to ourselves, we draw attention to Jesus. Amen. How many know God loves you today? Amen. Amen. This is a home folk, so we can preach, we can preach the home folk. All right, just in case. God is good. And when is he good? All the time. All the time. Let's dig into it a little more now. So Jesus is moving on the scene in verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. 
Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent from your worldly way of your worldly way of living. Repent from your sin. Repent from your iniquity. Repent from these things that are not consistent with godliness. We want to go to heaven. Amen. Yeah. We need to start living like we're already there. Yeah. We want to go to heaven. We need to start acting like we already are. We know, you know, up in heaven, there's not going to be people running around their thongs. So if we're just, so we're not going to be doing that now. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Brother Rosie, what are you doing? How many God loves you today? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Jesus is good to us. Brother, you're crazy, brother. See, he's such a nice guy. He never really digs around. Well, because I'm not trying to jack you up. I'm just trying to take, rip the covers off the devil. Amen? Yeah. The kingdom of repent ye for the, and believe the gospel. Believe what? Believe God loves you. Believe what? Believe there's a better way. Believe what? Believe you don't have to live a life of sin. I believe that if we, I believe that if, if people get saved, that we can live in a safe world. I believe God can clean up neighborhoods. He can clean up families. He can clean up individual hearts. He can clean up neighborhoods. He can have it to where we can leave our doors unlocked again at night and not have to worry about it. I said, Brother Ross, there was a time it was like that in America? Absolutely. It can be like that again. Amen? Amen. God can do all, God does all things well. God does all things well. He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. I begin to think about this now. And picture this. You see, little, you see uh, Simon out there and Andrew, they're out there fishing. Jesus, you know, he knows when the right time is to call us. He walked by the sea and he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net in the sea for they were fishers. God saw them. God sees us. He knows where we're at. He knows what's going on in our mind. And he loves us. Amen? Amen. He sees us. He sees us and he knows and he understands. He knows what challenges you have in your life. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows what is bothering you or or holding you or hurting you or holding your heart back. He knows what hurts you. He knows everything about you. God sees you. He saw you there. He saw you last night while you sat there in the studio. God knows what you're going through. I don't want to get ahead of myself because God's here right now. God loves us. Amen? Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers. How many times did Andrew come back home from hanging out with John the Baptist? And while he was out there hanging out with John the Baptist, what happened? What transpired? He had church and his brother was back home fishing. His brother was burdened. His brother had a lot on his heart and a lot in his mind. He was concerned. He, was, he had a lot going on. If we're going to read a little bit longer, his mother was, was sick. His, Peter was married and his, mo his mother-in-law was sick. Maybe Andrew was a dreamer. Maybe he was a musician. I don't know what kind of person he was, but I do know this. He liked to introduce people to Jesus. Maybe he came home after a long uh, day of services out there with, uh, with, the, with John the Baptist and sang a couple hymns. Maybe, was maybe on his lips were a couple worship songs like Monica does. She's always humming some songs. My wife is playing in the car. Maybe he was humming away a song, thinking about God, talking about God's goodness, and just sitting there kind of lost in his thoughts as they're working on the fishing boat. But Peter maybe is a little more uh, wrapped up, a little more consternation, a little more frustrated. Man, we got to get these fish in. We got to get them in because mom's sick. I got to, I got to get my, I need, we, need to, we need to get these fish in and get them into the market because I got to get some finances because I got to pay the doctor because mom's sick. And Andrew's over there just kind of in his own little world. You no, know, forgive me, my stuff. I use my imagination, but this is kind of how things are sometimes. And maybe he just kept looking at his brother and said, why don't you just come and hear John preach again? Why don't you just come and listen to Jesus? Uh, why don't you come and just let some of the, let things go. Let God get involved in your life and, and, and start trying, stop trying to figure everything out. Uh, just let God do a work in your life. Maybe as he out there and he's just, look, he's looking at that net and he constantly would use, they would use those nets to meet the needs in their lives. They would throw them out into the sea and they would catch their fish and they would use that time and time again to support themselves. But maybe while they threw those nets out there, they began to preach to them. They realized if they kept doing things the way they've always done them, they'd keep having the same results. And there needed to be a change. And although maybe they were getting by, 
They both knew in their heart of hearts, and Peter knew for one thing's for sure, that this life wasn't the way it ought to be. If your family doesn't know if he wants to live for Jesus just yet, just keep serving God. Amen. Just keep being what God wants you to be. Right. Just keep singing. Just keep playing. Keep loving each other, loving people. Amen? Amen? If your fellow Marines don't know if they want to serve God, just keep, keep on singing. Keep on trusting God. Keep on loving people because God loves them just like he loves us. Amen? Amen. How many know God loves everybody? God doesn't want anyone to perish. God wants everyone to go to heaven. Not everybody's going to go, but everybody can if they'll look to Jesus. The door is wide open. Nobody's too far off. If they're still breathing, God can still save them. Everybody you run into, everybody you run into is one miracle away from a transformed life. Can I get an amen? amen? And so while they're looking at these fishing nets, Jesus shows up at the right time. You know, God knows when the right time is. He saw them. He knows your situation. Let me read to you just a couple of verses out of Psalms 139. David said this, Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou, thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain to it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy right hand lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. God knows where we're living at. God knows where we're living at. If I say, surely darkness shall cover me, even the night shall light about me. We can try to hide from God, but God can't. we can't be hidden from Jesus. Doesn't matter how dark it may get, Jesus is there. Yea, darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness as the light, and both are alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. God knows us. Amen? He knows who we are, and God knows how to push the button. God knows how to flip the switch. God knows how to break through and meet the need in our lives. I don't care how hard we might get. I don't care what life may transpire. God knows how to make the difference in our lives. Amen. God is the answer. Amen? Amen. While Peter was out there fishing, that tough fella, and so it's, so it's been said as he was hardened by the sea and, and was familiar with these, the ways of the water and the ocean out there trying to take care of his family, Peter would learn something. Jesus walked by and said this. In verse 17, Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. I love this. Peter would change his focus. And God would provide for his situation. Jesus knows when to call us, and he has a plan. He said, come after me. I'll make you fishes of men. I'll give you better fish to fish after. Amen? I'll give you a better catch. And Peter would know what this is all about. When he'd preach in thousands, we'd get saved. And God would truly do and fulfill exactly what he said he would do. I'll make you to become fishers of men. He said, you're not yet, but you will be if you follow me. We're not yet. We have not yet. None of us have arrived. Amen? God still has a work to do in our lives. Amen. And I like what it says in verse 18. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Maybe you're sitting there looking at that net, sick and tired of it. You said, you know what? What do I got to lose? All right, Andrew, you win this time. <laughs> Throw that thing down. Let's go. And I bet if you asked Jesus or asked Peter, do you regret stepping out of the fishing boat that day? What do you think he would say? No. Not a chance. Not a chance. My life didn't start till I stopped fishing. Till I stepped out of that boat. He began to follow Jesus. He threw that net away. He threw that net away and he followed him. And what would happen? We're going to jump ahead just a little bit and come back in a little bit. But let, listen to what the word of God says. After he began to follow the Lord, it says in verse 30, But Simon's wife's mother, speaking of Peter here, his mother, lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he, Jesus, came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto him. You know, God can take care of things in our lives. Amen? Amen. Peter gave his life to Christ. 
He said, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how this is all going to work out. All I know is the fishing business is how I take care of my family, but I'm going to do what the master said. I'm going to follow Jesus. And guess what happened? The master took care of his problems. Amen? Amen. And as we follow the Lord, God will take care of our family. Amen? Amen. We love our family. Amen? Amen? We care about our family. We want them to be blessed as well. We want them to be blessed as well. And God will intercede as we do. Thank God Peter did what he was supposed to do. Thank God he followed Jesus. Because if he hadn't followed Jesus, there's a good chance that meeting between Jesus and his mom wouldn't have taken place. And mom got divinely healed. And so much she got healed that after that, she started making some tortillas for him. I'm just inserting my Mexican version in there. All right. God's good. Amen. How oh, my God loves you today. Amen. Appreciate the Lord. If it was an Italian family, probably pizza or something like that, or French bread. I don't know. God's good. All right. I appreciate the Lord today. God's good. I know God's good. Amen. Amen. And so they both got blessed. Peter got blessed. Andrew got blessed. Mom got blessed. Everybody got blessed. Because they stepped out of the fishing business. Uh, they stepped out of the fishing boat into a greater fishing business. Moving on a little bit further down now in this, in this portion of Scripture, we're going to look and see what happens to another group of friends. You know, thank God when God reaches us and does a work in our life, he has people to walk alongside with us. And so we didn't just reach out to this family, but he reached out to some of their, compa their companions. And these people, these two are quite the, quite the bunch. The Bible tells us in verse 19, And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. They had a nickname called, they were called the Sons of Thunder. Sounds like a motorcycle group. <laughs> so these two guys were also some tough fellows. Amen? But God was going to do work in their life and use them in a mighty way. And so they're in their ship doing what? They're fishing and they're mending. They're fishing and they're mending. You know, they're, P Peter and Andrew weren't alone. I want to read a scripture to you here out of my outline. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful. How many know God is faithful? There it is again. To simplify. I love him. All right. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with that temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Sometimes God will bring you right to your limit, but then he'll step in and help us out. Amen? And we learn that Jesus never fails. And so we see here in this predicament, verse 19, that he saw these men when he had gone a little further. He, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in their ship, mending their nets. What were they doing? They were mending their nets. We're talking about nets. Peter and Andrew forsook their nets. We see now these two men here are mending their nets. And maybe as they're mending their nets, the Holy Spirit, because thank God for the Holy Spirit, he's the greatest preacher that ever lived. He's the one that leads us and guides us in all truth. He's the one that draws us to a place of repentance. He's the one that takes, a, if I say anything noteworthy, that takes it and uses it and helps you in a special way. And so the, here the, the Holy Spirit maybe began to speak to their hearts as they were mending their nets. And maybe they began to look at their nets and see their nets maybe kind of like a microcosm of their own life. And a lot of people are like this in life. They, they're afraid to, tr they, they maybe threw their net out into the sea of this world only to find out in the process of doing so that it got torn. Maybe kind of like their heart. They got their heart hurt. They got their heart broken. They tore their, they threw their net out. They got hard. They got, they got their, their heart hurt, and so they got hardened, and they said, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to protect my heart. I'm not going to allow myself to love again. I'm not going to allow myself to have faith again. I'm not going to allow myself to trust again. And so they guard their heart, and they build these walls of walls around them. Sometimes it comes in all different kinds of forms, uh, all kinds of in, uh, insecurities, and they build that, they build up their heart. They try to hide it behind a wall of pride or something very in various different ways. And, and here these men were as they're maybe looking at that net. You know, and there's something about a torn net. Once it's torn, it can never be new again. You can mend it, but it's still an old net. And once a heart's been hurt, you can't, it can't, it's, it's, once it's hurt, it's wounded, you can't go back and undo the wound. How many know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. And so as we live, we get injured, we get hurt, things happen. And the devil says, see, that's what happens when you love, that's what happens when you trust, that's what happens when you step out, you get hurt. And then all of a sudden you build up this tough facade, and I'm not going to let it happen to me again. You try to, try to protect yourself and try to guard yourself from it. But what do we find out here? As they're mending their net, as they're sitting there mending their net, they're with their dad trying to just get another, just get another bunch of fish in for the day. As they're mending their nets, maybe a microcosm of their heart, straightway he called them Jesus again. And they left their father in the ship 
with the higher seven servants and they went after him. They realized something. This net's never going to be new again. And if we keep doing things that we've always done, it's always going to be the same. And so it is. But I've got good news for you. God can give you a new heart. God can mend your heart. In fact, he can not only mend it, he can miraculously, supernaturally change it, transform it, enlarge it, make it bigger than it ever was before, help you to learn to love more than you loved before, help you to be able to trust more than you ever trusted before, and you'll enjoy life more than you enjoyed it before because now you have perspective. Good friends mean a lot more. Amen? Life means more. Family means more. Friends me more. Everything about life has a new meaning because God has impacted your heart. And what is the hallmark? When Jesus touches our heart, we begin to look at the world and we begin to love our neighbor as ourselves. We care about each other people. And that kind of goes back to what we shared at the beginning of the service. It's not all about us. It's not about us getting the attention and us being the cat's meow. You know, if we want us brothers, when we walk into church, if everybody's wearing gray, it's kind of cool, you know. It's like, hey, you got the memo. I'm not up there going... <laughs> He wore my suit. <laughs> okay. All right. You know. Yeah. I wish I had hair like he does. No, I'm just joking. How many of God loves you today? Amen. Ain't got much. All right. <laughs> Brother Ross, he's crazy. Just a little bit. Sometimes it takes a little crazy to do what God wants you to do. Amen. All right. But so what do they do here? They say they got rid of those nets. They left dad in the ship. And maybe dad's like, hang on, hang on. Don't do that. But I'll tell you what, these sons of thunder got to see God move in a miraculous way. They'd probably go back and say, dad, let me tell you what God's done in my life. Uh, I'd love to hear Zebedee's story years later after his boys served God and they saw what a great difference. Such, to such a degree that these men that God called, their names are written on the foundations of the New Jerusalem. They're going to rule and reign with God. They're going to sit on the 12 thrones. I'm thinking of Caraballo, right? Paravel. Thinking about, uh, um, uh, uh, what's it? I'm trying to remember the name of it now. This uh, Chronicles of Narnia thing. But they're going to sit on the 12 thrones ruling uh, and judging angels. Talk about amazing. Amen? They went from the fishing boat to royalty. Yeah, they went from fishing boat to king's kids. They stepped out of their comfort zone, and God did a work in their life. And so what happens? We found out they gave up their nets, and they got something better. They left. This is so powerful, fishing and mending, but you need a new net. You need a new heart. You need a new purpose. You need a new beginning. And that's what God wants to do in our lives today. And so they traded the familiar for, for a walk with Christ. They traded the known for something better, for something greater. And that's what God's calling us to do. Will you let go of the known for the unknown? I know I'm in a group of great people this evening. I know I'm in a group, of, I'm in a place of people that have faith. Because you all did it when you left and joined the Marine Corps. You had to leave the known for the unknown. You had to leave the known for the unknown. You're like, that's right. And that's why I have a hard time trusting because it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Well, I got news for you. Serving Jesus isn't going to be what you thought it was going to be either. It's going to be better. It's going to be more glorious. Talk about real friends. I'm looking at a bunch yes. of real friends. Amen? Yes. God's good. Amen. Such a, such a, so good. There's so much I could share here. But see, we left the fishing boat of life. We left the fishing boats of the world. And we're looking to Jesus. We're looking to Jesus. And why? God would use these 12 men and these ladies that would follow to reach the world. To make a difference. They would, the world would find follow them. Say, you're turning the world upside down. But as Reverend Briggs said, no, they were turning it right side up. God was using them in a miraculous way. They let, he said, here we see, they left the known for the unknown. They left the familiar for faith. They followed the master and not their own ideas. They finally learned what the scripture meant. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths. Amen. And he'll direct your paths. As we get ready to close, Jesus is looking out over this congregation today. And he's trying to encourage us and say, come follow me. And I'll make you. I'll make you. Are we willing to let our lives go into the hands of an ever-capable master and let him make us? Are we willing to let God do the molding? See, really, that's the question. Is he our Lord? Is he our Savior? So many people are afraid to let the fishing boat go. They're afraid to let the nets go. But if we'll let God be God in our lives... God will do something glorious in our life. Amen? 
in the right time, at the right moment. Now, as I was praying, thinking about this message, thinking about those that might be in service tonight, some are here, some are not. But God loves you. He has a plan for you. He wants to give you a new heart, a new life, a new beginning. And God doesn't want to just bless you, but he wants to bless everybody that you know. I mean, know God loves you today. Amen. As you bow your heads and you close your eyes in reverence to God, as the musicians come, begin to play. A transformation must take place. A change must transpire. And as it's been shared before, before we knew Jesus, we were a bunch of caterpillars walking around in this world. But it's not God's desire for us to crawl around in this filthy old world, but to learn what it means to fly. And so we need to enter into the cocoon of faith and let the goodness of God change our hearts and our minds. And let God begin to work in our inner hearts. Enter into the cocoon of faith. And then let God help you break forth out of that cocoon and learn what it means to fly. Learn what it means to transcend this life. Learn what it means to be more than conquerors. More than a conqueror because he loved us. Know what it means to soar, to fly. God's here right now. He's been so good to us. As they begin to sing, as they begin to Praise God, this altar's open. Let's come follow him. Let's leave behind our fishing boats, spiritually speaking, and trust the Lord to make a difference in our life. And by doing it, you might find out that God will heal mom. You might find out that God will touch your, your friends. You might find out that God will do the work, and he will. Because God doesn't just love you, but he loves your entire, everybody around you. Everybody in your circle of influence, God loves you. God bless you. Give your life to Jesus. Let your nets go. And trust the Lord. God bless you.